I will be reading Revelation 2 to 3 from the New Living Translation. Write this letter to the angel of the church in Ephesus. This is the message from the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven gold lampstands. I know all the things you do. I have seen your hard work and your patient endurance. Are your ears awake? Listen, listen to the wind words, the spirit blowing through the churches. Write this letter to the angel of the church of Smyrna. This is the message from the one who is the first and the last, who was dead but is now alive. I know about your suffering and your poverty, but you are rich. Don't be afraid of what you are about to suffer. Are your ears awake? Listen, listen to the wind words, the spirit blowing through the churches. Write this letter to the angel of the church of Thyatira. This is the message from the Son of God, whose eyes are like flames of fire, whose feet are like polished bronze. I know all the things you do. I have seen your love, your faith, your service, and your patient endurance. And I can see your constant improvement in all these things. I will ask nothing more of you except that you hold tightly to what you have until, until I come. Are your ears awake? Listen. Listen to the wind words, the spirit blowing through the churches. Write this letter to the angel of the church of Sardis. This is the message from the one who has the sevenfold spirit of God and the seven stars. I know all of the things you do and that you have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead. Wake up, strengthen what little remains, for even what is left is almost dead. Go back to what you heard and believed at first and hold on to it firmly. Are your ears awake? Listen, listen to the wind words, the spirit blowing through the churches. Write this letter to the angel of the church of Philadelphia. This is the message from the one who is holy and true, the one who has the key of David. What he opens, no one can close, and what he closes, no one can open. I know all the things you do, and I have opened a door for you that no one can close. You have little strength, yet you obeyed my word and did not deny me. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take away your crown. Are your ears awake? Listen. Listen to the wind words, the spirit blowing through the churches. Write this letter to the angel of the church of Laodicea. This is the message from the one who is the Amen, the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of God's new creation. I know all the things you do, that you are neither hot nor cold, but I wish you were one or the other. I correct and discipline everyone I love, so be diligent and turn from your indifference. Look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and we will share a meal together as friends. Are your ears awake? Listen. Listen to the wind words, the spirit blowing through the churches. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. May the Lord have his blessing on the reading of his word. Thank you, Kieran. We kind of cut out some parts of that, those two chapters, you might have noticed, but it's about the church, and to pick, catch some of you up a little bit, um, we're looking at the book of Revelation, but not necessarily all of it in terms of you feeling like you know all about the book of Revelation by the time we're done. It would take more than the few weeks we we're putting into it this time. But we're looking at it in terms of it being this is a simple concept that I, I push, put forward a few weeks ago, that it is the last book in the Bible. It, that wasn't a hard one to sell. People know, they look in their Bible, and it's the last book. So you're all, we're all in agreement there. However, understanding that it, the purpose of a, something at the end of the book, or the last chapter, or if you have a, um, a manual working on something, it's Step 10 is before all the other, is at the end and not before the other steps. So we've been looking at this and, and with the idea that in the book of Revelation, God is giving us the last words or the last view on several different things. And we've looked at the last word on scripture. And then last week we had a beautiful vision that, John, that God gave John of what Jesus looked like in terms of his power and and it was the, the purpose of this letter it is a, a letter that was written for certain people at a certain time and because 
we do this with the Bible all the time, is we say, God, it's God's word and it's for us today. It's living and alive, but it has a context. And John was told, as uh, Jesus did in the beginnings of each of these sections in today's reading, it was a letter given instruction to John to write to these particular seven churches. So today, we're going to talk a little bit about church. And churches, well, you're here. You came to church. In, you know that I speak Spanish, and in our, in our Spanish friends uh, make quite a, a clear distinction between the building and the people. And they have, we do too if we won't, we're more careful, this is the church building, and we are the church, the people are the church. And, but, there's all kinds of questions when it comes to church nowadays when we use the word the same way, we say we're going to church and oftentimes what, what happens happened in a relationship the week before or a couple of weeks ago and, and we don't like church anymore because so-and-so looked the wrong way at us or we didn't get told something or, and all of a sudden we don't want to go to church and, or be the church or something like that because we don't make that distinction. But there's lots of people nowadays that say that they, they love Jesus and they love to be in, doing spiritual things, but this idea of church is really old. Especially when you gather together and you all sit facing the front and one guy up at the front talking. That can get old real quick. And I trust that you'll give me a few more minutes before it's old, eh? Just hold on there. But some people are asking whether church as we know it is done. It's time to move on. Just go straight to the heart of other people with Jesus' words. And that's good. That's a good idea. We need to be connecting as Jesus' followers. And if whatever gets in the way, well, don't let it get in the way. And if it's church, don't go to church. In fact, maybe you could do something else on Sunday morning. But I don't think I'll go into that right now because I might get you convinced and then I won't be here next week. But... What we have, the actions we follow and the things we do aren't necessarily the church the way John was instructed to write to the group of believers in each of these seven places. This is really important, what John wrote, to help us think about what we think about church, <coughs> where we fit in. So important that he finished every phrase with, you better listen. In fact, he said, if you have ears, and who doesn't, you need to listen and do something. If you look in your bulletin, inside the bottom page, there's a little quote there from Eugene Peterson from the book that I've been getting a lot of this, these ideas from. It's called Reverse Thunder. And he says, very clearly, it is... God's will that we have a church. He's pretty firm on that. It's God's will that we have a church. The life of faith always and necessarily takes place in a community of persons who are located somewhere in time and place. There's no evidence in the annals of ancient Israel or in the pages of the New Testament that churches were ever much better or much worse than they are today. A random selection of seven churches in any century, including our own, would turn up something very much like the seven churches to which St. John was pastor. Did you get that? Did you understand what he was saying? These are seven letters, and, I, and Kieran didn't skip one. I, there's only six in the scripture if you were counting. I, we're trying to get it a little bit to fit here. You need to be reading all the words from chapters 2 and 3. Uh, and from whatever version you're comfortable with. But you need to be reading that. We didn't share it. As often we try to share in our scripture time the, the whole scripture. But today we did not. I did uh, select different verses. And um, in each letter, there's certain content. 
and their spiritual direction that Jesus himself, the Jesus of the vision, the Jesus so powerful and so bright that they couldn't look at him. And, and we talked about that last week. A powerful Jesus, an in, absolutely in control Jesus. And he himself has words for spiritual direction for all these believers as they work together in community and churches. So we better be listening. Because that describes us. We want to be working for the Lord in our community as a body of believers, as a church, by definition. But it keeps saying, and, the, the, and Karen read it for us at the end of each section from the, the message, the, from that verse, are your ears awake? Listen. Listen to the wind words. The spirit blowing among the churches. And then the NLT version says, anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he's saying to the churches. We know that there is a difference between listening and hearing. And there's lots of ways I could have illustrated that this morning, and a lot of them, you, a lot of them are pretty funny jokes. But after a while I realized most of them were pointed at men, so I didn't bring any. Uh, we know the difference. There is a difference between listening and hearing. And Clint Kent, if you put up that slide, I have to, you can't read it very good from there, so I'll turn around and read it from here. Yeah, I almost can't read it from here. There, this one works better. The difference between hearing and listening, and I'll summarize this in one, one sentence, but here, these are scientists that know this. They say that hearing is a physical process, natural and passive. That means it happens to you when you hear. But listening is physical as well as a mental process. It's active, not passive. It, it takes action. It's a learned process. It's a skill. Listening is hard, it says in red here, and you can't read it. Listening is hard. You must choose to participate in the process of listening. Huh. That's really, in that's really interesting. You think that the Lord of the universe Jesus, as he's instructing these churches and instructing us, know, knew the difference between listening and hearing. So he says, listen to the wind words. The spirit is blowing through the churches. If you have ears to hear, you must listen to the spirit and understand what he's saying to the churches. It takes action. When we hear something, we need to respond. And so the call is to the... The words that Jesus has for the churches means that we need to not only just hear, physically hear the words, we need to do something about it to show that we listen. Like I say, there's lots of different, uh, very humorous, and, and like I say, they were mostly about the men not listening and stuff like that. So I didn't bring any of those cartoons, so you're not getting any of those, but you can look them up yourself on the, online and have a good laugh. But there was a fellow named Marshall McLuhan that studied communication. Communications are, is what listening and hearing and all that's about. And he said, it's interesting that nature did not equip us with ear lids. I, you know, when you, I read that and I thought, Marshall McLuhan is a really smart guy. That's a weird concept. We're, we, but we got eyelids, they take me to rest. But uh, we don't have ear lids. It's always open. So something's going on all the time. We get to hear it. And so um, we understand that it, we can learn to have selective hearing. And selective hearing is when you decide not to listen, you just hear. And you choose. You're actually hearing, but you're not going to do anything about it. And like I say, there's lots of illustrations about that. Let me read something else from our scientists here. Ken, if you put the next one up. It's a little easy to read. Listening is not the same as hearing. This is obviously from some textbook, right? Uh, they even, I didn't even take the title out. I don't know what book it's. Oh, I can find it for you. But Listening is not the same as hearing. Hearing refers to the sounds that you hear, whereas listening requires more than that. Requires focus. That's what Jesus was saying to the churches. When you hear something, when you hear the words from him, and we hear words from him all the time, we need to do something with them. And the word is focus here. Listening means paying attention not only to the story, but
but how it's told. The use of language and voice and how the other person uses his or her body. In other words, it means being aware of both verbal and nonverbal messages. Your ability to listen effectively depends on the degree to which you perceive and understand. So Jesus kept saying it. When every time he, he finished his little portion to each church, he's telling John, write these letters to these churches, and he finishes it off, if you have ears. Anyone who has ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he's saying. So it's so applicable to our walk with Jesus that we need to pay attention. We need to take it seriously that our walk with Jesus, our church life, if you want to say it, our spiritual life is something that we just don't let happen to us. That would be hearing. We need to listen and then take action. So, what are the, some of the things we need to take action on? Well, in each of these seven letters, and as you might imagine, you may have heard sermons on, from Revelation, and when the pastor got to these seven letters, he took seven weeks or maybe even longer because there's so much in each of these little letters inside the letter of Revelation. But each one of them starts off with a, a, a spiritual direction and an affirmation or way to go, you're doing fine. And if you look at that and you see that and look for it, it's, actually you don't have to look for it, it's there very clearly um, in each one of them. There's an affirmation. He says, I know. And it's the kind of, when Jesus, creator of all the universe, the Son of God, says, I know, yet don't try to figure out how much he does know or he doesn't know. Or you think that you maybe hid some things from him, he doesn't know everything? Well, he does. He knows everything. And he starts off saying, I know you're suffering in your poverty. I know all the things you do. He says several times to them. I know these things you do and you have a reputation for being alive. And then he says, hits them with the next part. But the churches are affirmed in their work no matter what they're doing. Now, they need a little fine-tuning and we'll get to that in a minute. But the affirmation, he says about their tireless work, the great work they're doing, their brave suffering, their brave steadfastness, their growing discipleship. Wonderful things that Jesus recognized and wanted the church to know that he knew. That's important. That you don't start off getting beat up. And he gets going there in lots of these letters. Each one of them have the next part, which is a little heavier than that. But the church is great and a glorious living, uh, a way to live out the call to follow Jesus. And Jesus affirms that. And we need to hear that in an affirmation of what we're doing here this morning. The affirmation of, you, when you first come to this church, I, when I come to this church, first came and I looked around and I thought, there have been people of vision that spent time and money and worked hard for many, many years. And you, you read some of the numbers out front from 18... 18 65 or something, way back. For a long time in Brandon, the Baptist church has been doing good things, amazing things that we're still here. I mean, lots of, anyway, that we can feel that affirmation that Jesus knows what's going on. And we can feel good about that affirmation. Because church life changes people. When people come to church or are involved with other people and are part of church, lives get changed. People learn about the love of God and they get to practice it on each other. And many, you, many of you have fond memories of that kind of thing happening. In your church life, some of you have been involved for many, many years and it, it just, you wouldn't do without it because it speaks so strongly to, to good things in your life. And that's, those are the affirmation things. We can get some of these affirmation words too, despite the ups and downs that go on. But right away, Jesus moved on in every one of the letters, a little bit different in a couple of them, 
But he moves on to a, 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 the word correction. He says, in one of them, he says, but I have this against you. You're doing really well, but pay attention. You can get better. In fact, it's a little stronger in some of these. I have this against you. And these words weren't easy for the churches to hear. And they're not easy for us to hear when somebody says, you're doing fine, and you just wait. You're gonna, you can know what they're going to say next. But you forgot to wipe the table. And you just cleaned the kitchen. and, and You know how it goes. You can never please some people. Okay. Linda's not here, and that had no reference to my house cleaning. But anyway, you know what I'm saying. But the corrections here are the heart of what Jesus wanted the churches to hear. And what we need to listen carefully to that. It's not easy to hear these. So many situations have to do with, that Jesus is talking about, have to do with letting the surrounding culture steal the energy and the joy from the believers. And that's nothing new for us. No matter what scripture we're using and reading, that's what, where it comes down to it, that we're encouraged to hang on, carry on. Don't let the world press you into its mold, says Romans 2, uh, 12, 2. So we're in that same stage. We know what's going on. And a lot of the, the ch churches that received these letters, they were having real trouble with that. They were in the, what's now Turkey, and in that part of, uh, of Asia where uh, the Romans, and I've spoken of this many times, that the Roman government was, had taken a lot area all over. There had been wars there, and a lot of the soldiers, big, big, big armies, the Roman armies, they won. But they really didn't, the government really didn't want them back in Rome. That's too many people. And so they had them settle in these other cities. And um, as they settled, they wanted them to be good Romans and have the, their religion. So they had all these religions, the religions of the area, and then the, the big religion of worshiping Caesar as Lord. And so these churches got themselves in trouble when they let those religions, that culture, water down what Jesus was talking about. One of the other problems that he mentions is that internal relationships with churches, inside churches, they're people. And we understand this point very clearly, and we all, all of us have stories about some particular person, and one family didn't like what the other family was doing, and, and then they left, and then now we don't, they don't go to our church, they go to another one, and you've got all kinds of these stories, and, and outsiders watch, and they see what's going on inside the church, and or they hear from somebody, and they say, well, I'd never want to go there, I've got enough stress in my life. And it's true. Somehow, stress and broken relationships inside the body of believers affects us in a deeper and more painful way. It's a truth. Jesus says that these churches were going through religious motions after spirit motives were gone. They had forgot what they were doing when they were gathering together. They weren't worshiping Jesus anymore. They weren't looking to Jesus to get their strength and, and their direction. They started to be acting like this is what I do, that I want to be identified as part of that social club. Now, maybe it didn't happen quite that way for the churches that these letters were going to because they were facing persecution and it was coming and it came years, not too many years after this. And, and so some of these words were to prepare them for the suffering they were going through. You don't fight over little things if you, your life's on the line. So these churches were going through these religious motions after spirit motives were gone. Their sluggish lives were propped up by termite-ridden timbers of a once re vigorous religion. It's amazing how time changes things. And, and, and it's on a personal level, and when we talk about how excited, we remember how excited you were when you first met the Lord. When you first discovered that how wonderful it felt to be forgiven that you weren't on the hook for all this stuff. When you said, Jesus, I accept your love. I accept you. I accept your forgiveness. Yay! You remember that way back? 
And then there's some people go through that and they're bouncing, at, they're at church and they got this big grin on their face and you and your buddy over there in the back, you say, whoa, that won't last long. <laughs> Wait until they meet so-and-so. <laughs> well, that sad thing is, by the way Jesus was talking to these churches, we didn't invent that. It's been going on all the time in every group of believers. Times change and we're challenged to stay excited by our forgiveness and our grace. And why is it that we need to be challenged to stay that way? It should be natural. If you haven't read something this week from the Word of God that broke you and brought you to the same place that you were when you said, Lord, come into my heart. I need you every hour. If you haven't read anything that this week, then guess what? It won't matter so much. You won't be happy. You won't be joyful. You won't be thinking about the grace of God as you walk out in the street. You're dragging your tail. Moping. Get into the word and he says many times in this, these letters, get back to where you were when you started. Don't forget these things. We need to help one another do that. We need to keep focusing on those, his word. We need to practice his love together and lift one another up so that we enjoy those first days of being in love with Jesus. So he, in his spiritual direction to these churches, he affirms them, then he gives correction. And, and I, obviously, I have not got into detail. I could have named every one of those churches and all the details on, on each one of these things, but we do want to finish today. So. Uh, you need to read these verses and what I'm doing giving you is an outline and a guide so when you do read this, these two chapters you are more informed and know what to look for a little bit. It is about you. It is about us. Not just those churches. The third element is promise. Each time there's a promise. Each letter has a clear word of promise and motivation. The wonderful promise of eternal relationship is central for all us too because that's what was here an eternal relationship with God that's the promise and we use a whole bunch of different words to describe that 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 relationship in verse uh, 20 of chapter 3 look at me I stand at the door I knock if you hear me call open the door I'll come right in and sit down to supper with you wow it's in the Bible about having church suppers you know that well sort of, but the, it's right here, the idea of that personal relationship with God. If you do these things, if you, you stay connected, stay joyful, stay giving the credit where it's due, it belongs to God with his love and mercy for, for, for looking after us and changing our viewpoint of the way we see the world. It's a personal relationship. Often this is seeing this, this verse is used to, to bring somebody along in their, in their decision into the faith. And, and yet we know by reading this is that it, it is a, a collective thing. It's a community thing that Jesus is writing to the churches. And, but that doesn't make any change in any way. The personal relationship uh, is clear. We understand that. But we don't have to wait for heaven or just think about being loved by God is God is spirit. We can see that these promises include all of us together. And there is a difference there. When we talk about and think about in our, our devotions and our reading the Psalms or reading the, anything in the Word and we give the Lord, we say, thank you, God, that you love me. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for giving me the wisdom. Thank you for giving me peace and joy. But when it's all about me, when, I, when, you, when you talk like that, there's just you and God. And I don't think that was the intention. That's, we're not taking away from that. That's beautiful and powerful. But the action resulting from your relationship with God is that you have a relationship with other Christians. Because if you don't, it's way too easy. Because then you make up all the rules, even when you break them, you can just change them. Because it's just you and God, and God's not really there 
if you're not listening and, or you got the TV on or something like that. There's lots of ways that we can block it out. So what I'm saying is, and Jesus is saying, get together. Understand that you need to grow as a community, helping each other grow. It's not easy. The church is the body. And it sometimes the, the body malfunctions. It gets sick. It's still the body. You don't throw it out. You find a doctor and try to get better. Well, the church gets sick. But you just don't walk away and go to another one or find another group of believers. You work it out. You ask for healing of the body. We expect a community of saints who are mature in virtues of love and mercy, but we find ourselves working on a church supper where there is more gossip than there are casseroles. I couldn't leave that quote out, could I? We have expectations of what our gathering together should get for us. And when it doesn't happen, we declare the church broke. We de declare that the church doesn't work for me anymore. So we do something else, find something else to do, or somebody to blame. But it's our expectations that need to change. It's pretty tough, isn't it? It's our expectations, not the church. If our expectations are that we're going to only be around mature people and with the virtues of love and mercy, then you haven't met people I know in church. See the expectations. And I'm not saying lower your expectations, but get real. We're all in here together. This is a hospital for sinners. So we come together, all of us, to let God change us, to heal us. And that's an exciting thing to do together. Church is not what we organize, but what God gives. Church is not what we organize, but what God gives. Not the people we want to be with, but the people God gives us to be with. I'm quoting right out of my book on, from Peterson there. It's not what we organize, but what God gives. It's not the people we want to be with, but the people God gives us to be with, the community. It is God's will that we have a church. The life of faith always and necessarily takes place in a community of persons who are located somewhere in time and place. Remember that one? Oops. Here we are. Here's the church. We're here, the church. Get ready, Kieran. You're going to get excited. Here's the church, and here's the steeple. Open the doors. And there's all the people. You can use that with the grandkids today, Ed. We are the church. This is what we do. Are you awake? Are your ears awake? Listen. Listen to the wind words, the spirit blowing through the churches. As we gather around the communion table today, we ask that the Lord will have mercy on us. And open our hearts and our minds in a, to one another in the work we have to do together. Yes, we can be affirmed that we come so far. But there's so many things that need to change. What does Jesus have against you? About, against us as a church? What are we missing? Ask the Lord to give you guidance and then share it together. I'm going to ask the uh, folks that are going to help serve communion to gather, and we'll gather around the, the communion table at this time.